Okay, good morning everybody. Good morning. Let's go ahead and get started. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, we're going to continue with the study of Daniel chapter 2. And uh, let's open in prayer first. Let's join in prayer. Father, we want to come to you this morning and thank you for this beautiful morning and uh, the rain that you're giving us today. And uh, ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit will guide us now as we study your word. Father, help us to understand it and uh, to apply it into our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We're going to do a quick review. We want to do a part three on Daniel chapter two, but I want to do a quick review on part one and part two. And if you want, open your Bibles with me to Daniel chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 13, and then we'll get into our review. Daniel chapter 2, starting with verse 1, it says, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut to pieces and your house is turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time, because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is just one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation would change. So then tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it. The astrologers answered the king, There is not a man on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among men. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. We're going to do a quick review, but you know, this passage I was sharing in the prayer group last night, the prayer meeting, uh, touched me so much years ago. And the reason being is because these people actually received something from God, as we're going to find out in, in our study today. They heard from heaven. And as a Christian, I've noticed over the years, you know, that the, the body of Christ, we have a lot of rituals, a lot of traditions, and they're powerless. We don't receive anything from God. They're just rituals. For example, how many times do we have to go up to the altar before we hear from God? How many times do we have to have prayer over us before God answers that prayer? There are just many things that we do that have turned into traditions and rituals, and they're actually powerless. We need to hear from God. When we have a need, we need to hear from God. And that's what these folks did. They woke up one morning, there was a knock on their door, and this uh, Babylonian had come, he said, the king has ordered your death. And bad Daniel and his friends realized, we need to hear from God. We don't need a ritual, we don't need a tradition, we need to know what God is saying, and, uh, and to hear from him. And they did, so let's do a quick review. Uh, the king had a dream, Daniel chapter 2, verse 1, says, In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. Verses 5 and 6, there was a demand he made. It says, the king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided, that if you do not tell me my dream, uh, what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut to pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will have received from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. There was a death threat. Uh, verses 12 and 13, he says, 
This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death. And the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. And folks, there was deliverance. Verses 19 and verse 24 says, During the night the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. So Daniel and his friends heard from God. And this is the God that we serve. He's alive and well, and he wants to be involved in the affairs of mankind. So what did Daniel and his friends do that they were able to receive this miracle from God and to save themselves and to others? Uh, four thoughts. In part one, we shared that the first thing they did was pray. And that's so critical, folks, because... We need to be men and women of prayer. And we need to learn that when a crisis comes our way, the first thing we want to do is pray. A lot of times we'll, we will, we will uh, react to a crisis. Sometimes we'll seek human wisdom. Sometimes we'll try to get out of the situation. Daniel and his friends, the first thing they did was that they prayed. They also noted the approach and the content of the prayer. Their prayer was specific. It was not vague. They prayed concerning this matter. Uh, they approached God in humility. They pleaded for mercy. And the reason they did that is because they knew of four things about God. And the first was that contrary to public opinion and popular opinion, folks, God is a good God. And I want to say that contrary to a situation or circumstances, God is a good God. When that knock came on their door that morning and they said, we're here to execute you, come with us, do you know what they knew? They knew that God was still a good God. Those circumstances had not changed God. Secondly, they knew that God wants to reveal himself and his goodness and to bless all people. Indiscriminately, God wants to do that. All people. Thirdly, they realized that we can limit him or even close the door to him in our lives if we choose. And fourthly, they knew that God's goodness and his mercy will always be greater than anything we can ask for or even imagine if we can trust him for that mercy. If we can trust him for that, it, is, it will always be greater. So that's a review of part one and part two. I want us to look at part three now of this study. And it's the third element that brought about this answer to prayer and this miracle in the lives of Daniel and his friends. Look with me in chapter 2, verse 16. Something very important that Daniel knew. It says, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. What a strange request. It says that Daniel went into the king's presence and he asked for time. He said, king, if you'll give me time, I will do it. And it's interesting to note, folks, that what everybody else said they could not do, Daniel said, you give me time and I'll do it. We were sharing in our prayer group some time back, and uh, I was telling the folks, don't say, I can't do something. Say, Lord, help me to do it. Don't say, I can't. Say, God, help me, and we'll do this. This will get done if you will help me, Lord. But don't limit God by saying, I can't. Don't say, I can't. Say, God, help me. This is what the astrologers and the magicians and so forth did. They said, we can't do it. It's not possible. But Daniel said, if you'll give me time, I can do it. Now, why did he ask for time? Daniel knew the destiny of any situation and the very course of human history could be altered because of seven words he spoke in chapter 2, verse 28. Now, let me say that again. Daniel knew the destiny of any situation and the very course of human history could be altered because of seven words spoken in chapter 2, verse 28. Listen to what it says. Daniel speaking, he says, There is a God in heaven who, and you can fill in the blank, folks, who answers prayer, who does miracles, who brings healing, who delivers from the devil. You can fill in the blank, but there is a God in heaven who, who does all of those above. I was in a state prison here in Colorado some time back, ministering, and one of the inmates uh, spoke with me. And he said, Alan, he says, I want you to know that the system is set up 
here in the state of Colorado that when we get released from prison and we go into a halfway house, the system is set up for failure. That we're always going to fail and we're going to end up back in prison. And he kind of explained this to me, and, and I admit some of the situation there is, is not the best, but I shared this passage with him. And I said, you know what, that system, you may feel that way about that system, but brother, I want you to know something. There is a God in heaven who can see you through. There is a God in heaven that if you will lay hold of him, you don't have to go back to prison. You don't have to if you will lay hold of this God in heaven. And you can fill in the blank. There is a God in heaven who, like I said, can protect, can provide, can deliver, can heal, can guide, whatever the situation. Now Daniel knew that God is alive and well in heaven, didn't he? There's a God in heaven, he said. But he also knew that God is alive and well in the realm of mankind. And that's what we need. I want to share several verses with you. Uh, let me write these down so you can make reference to them if you need to. The first is Isaiah 14, chapter 14, verse 27. And then we're going to look at Isaiah 43, verse 13. And then we're going to look at Exodus, chapter 3, verse 7. Let's look first at Isaiah 14, verse 27. Listen to what God says to the prophet. He says, For the Lord Almighty has purposed, and who can thwart or frustrate him? His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? God has purposed, and who is going to frustrate his purpose? He asks this question, who's going to frustrate God's purpose? Nobody. Absolutely nobody, because there's a God who's alive and well in heaven, and that God is alive and well in the realm of mankind. It says his hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? Once God moves, who is going to turn God's hand back? Absolutely nobody. Listen to the prophet again in chapter 43, verse 13. He says, yes, and from ancient times I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? Nobody is going to deliver out of the hand of God when he moves in the realm of mankind. He says, when I act, who can reverse it? And obviously the answer is nobody. Nobody's going to challenge God. I love Exodus chapter 3, verse 7. God speaking to Moses, he says, The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So this God is not only alive and well in heaven, folks. This God is alive and well in the realm of mankind. When he moves, nobody's going to reverse it. And when he sees your need, folks, and he says, I am concerned about that suffering, I'm concerned about that need, he's going to move in your life. And that's what Daniel and, and uh, his friends needed. Daniel also knew that this God is Lord. He is Lord. He is God. Do you remember in the 1960s there was a television show on here in the United States called The Addams Family? Who remembers that show? Okay, we all remember it. During the show, there was a particular time where uh, the man, and I, I forget his name, what was his name? Gomez. Gomez. And Gomez would pull a rope and the whole house would shake. And who would appear Lurch. at that time? Lurch. Lurch. Lurch would appear. He would pull this big rope, the house would shake, and a servant by the name of Lurch would appear. And he would say, you're right. You're right. And Gomez would always tell him, you know, Lurch, go to the front door, and Lurch, do this, or Lurch, do that. You know, folks, the church has an Adams County Lurch mentality. Did you know that? We think that every time we call or pull the rope, that God is to come running and to meet every need that we have. There was a book also printed in the 1970s by the title of Hey God. Did anybody read that? I know of it, but I never read it. It was about a lady by the name of Mama Folio, and she had this supposed relationship with God that every time she had a need, she would simply say, Hey God, I need more food. Or, hey God, I need money. Or, Hey God, I need... And God was always just there, right there. It was a Hey God. 
And we have that mentality. I was in a service once. At the end of the service, the pastor asked everybody to close their eyes, bow their heads, and he said, Folks, I want you to know that Jesus is walking up and down these aisles. Just tell him what you want. Just place your order. Now, I want to be honest with you this morning. When I heard that, I personally told the Lord, I said, you know, Lord, I don't really like that, but if you're taking orders, I'll take a Big Mac with a large order of fries and a Coke, and could you supersize it, please? <laughs> could you, would you mind supersizing it, since you're just walking up and down in these aisles taking orders? Well, folks, the fact is that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's not Lurch. He is not Lurch. Daniel knew that this situation could change and that God would move in his life and help. But God required time. God required time. God wasn't there for Daniel to pull the rope and him to run on the scene and say, what, what do you want? And he wasn't there for Daniel to say, hey God, uh, we need a dream and an interpretation or place in our order. God could change the situation and the outcome of this entire situation, but God required time. Now, why does God require time? Why would he say, I want, give me time? Why did Daniel know that it would take time for him to hear from God? There's several reasons. I want to share a few, uh, four thoughts about it. And there's much to say about it, but I want to share four thoughts. And the first of those thoughts, folks, is because God loves us, wants us to spend quality time with him. Did you know that God wants us to spend time with Him? He doesn't want to have the lurch relationship or the hey God relationship. He doesn't want us to say, hey God, and He come running. He wants us to spend time with Him. That's fellowship. And that's a mystery to me. You know, how can the eternal God, the one who has lived from forever to forever, say, I want, I want you to talk to me. I want you to sit in my presence. I want to fellowship with you. But you know, that has always been God's plan. It has always been His plan. Listen to this. We're going to look at several verses. Let me write these on the board. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Then we're going to go to Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. And we're going to go to John. 114. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians 3 16. We're going to go to Revelation 1 12 through 13. And then Revelation 21 verse 3. So that's quite a few verses, and if you want to, uh, to save a little bit of time, I can read those through, and if you want to copy them down and look at them later, you're welcome to do that. God has always wanted fellowship with mankind and to be a part of our lives. Now listen to what these, these verses say. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, first of all, it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Do you know what God was doing? What was happening in that situation? God was coming down in human form, it was a theophany, to walk with man and woman in the garden of Eden and to fellowship with them. He was coming in the cool of the evening to fellowship with mankind. Now the problem is that mankind had sinned and rebelled against God and they hid from God. And that fellowship was broken. They hid from God. So what did God do? God didn't abandon that love or that desire to fellowship with mankind. Uh, time went on and uh, look at Exodus 25, 8. God speaking to Moses. He says, uh, then have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. And what this was was the tabernacle. And what God was saying is he had gone through a process of time where the uh, Israelites went into Egypt. He brought them out through the hand of Moses. They were his people, and God wanted to dwell among them. Now, these people were not living in a stable, uh, a, an established city. And so in order for God to dwell among them, he had to set up a, they had to set up a tabernacle. 
which could be set up and then taken down and set up and taken down every time they moved. And the whole concept was that God would dwell among the people as they moved. In the time they, they went into uh, Israel, the Promised Land, the land of Canaan, uh, they conquered it and God had them in the course of time build a temple where he would, his presence would dwell with them because they were no longer wanderers. They were no longer traveling. Okay, look at uh, John chapter 4, or 1 verse 14. The time came where the, it says the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Now the time came where God no longer dwelt in the temple. But God came in human form, and he dwelt among mankind. This is where people touched God Almighty, who became a human being. He walked among them, he cared for them, he listened to them, he taught them, and he dwelt among them. Once again, and he had fellowship with mankind. He was a part of the life of mankind. Look at 1 Corinthians 3.16. And by the way, that's an easy verse to remember. Most of us know of John 3.16. Uh, the 3.16s are interesting. Genesis 3.16, John 3.16, 1 Corinthians 3.16, there's a number of them. But listen to this. It says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? And so we had the progression here where God walked in the garden and then man sinned so that fellowship was broken. So he says, well, build me a tabernacle so I can travel with you and be among you. There was a temple eventually built where he lived among them. And the time came when God became a human being and dwelt among mankind. And when Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead and went to see at the right hand of the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit, which is God the Spirit. And God the Spirit, the Bible says, lives within us. That we are his temple. And so now God came to live within mankind. Now look at Revelation 1.12. John says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. Hallelujah. You know what that's telling us? Those seven golden lampstands represent the church, the body of Christ, worldwide. And do you know what it says here? It says there was one among the lampstands. That was Jesus. Jesus, once again, fellowshipping with the church, the body of Christ, worldwide. Whenever Christians meet, guess who's present? The Son of God. And He's here for fellowship and for worship and for caring for our needs, to be a part of our life and everything about us. And one last passage, Revelation 21, 3. John writing, he says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Listen to this. Now the dwelling of God is with man, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. The final climax of God's desire for fellowship and to be a part of human life. It says, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. God's desire for that fellowship with mankind will be fulfilled. So the first thing Daniel knew, folks, is that God loves us, and he wants us to spend quality time with him. And that's one reason why he said to the king, give me time, and I'll interpret the dream for you. Because he knew that God isn't just the lurch, boom, and he comes running, or the hey God, God. If we'll spend time with him, guess what? He'll talk to us. He'll fellowship with us. And Daniel knew that. Now the second thing Daniel knew was that God wants us to learn to listen to him. He wants us to learn to listen to him. We all want to talk and to be heard. All of us do. We want to talk to ourselves. We want to talk to others. And we want to talk to God. But we need to learn to listen. All of us need to learn to listen. I spent 11 years as a volunteer clergy with the Kairos Prison Ministry here in the state of Colorado. It's a great, great ministry. They go into, they're all over the country, the United States, and into several other countries now. And it's a wonderful, wonderful ministry. Uh, and as we train, we have to go through a training period every time before we go into a prison, no matter how many times we've been part of that ministry. And part of the training, we go through a, a, a course where we have to learn to listen. We train to listen. 
And that way, when we go into prison, we're not just walking up to these inmates and, and talking and talking and talking. We want them to talk to us. In order for that to happen, we have to listen. And what we do is we'll break up into groups of three, and now we know what's going on. We'll tell the first person, you tell me something, take two minutes and tell me something very special in your life. So that person listens. And then the second person will go to the third person and will say the same thing. And then the third person will come back to the first person. But this time, when he tries to tell the first person something special, that first person always is distracted. They'll say, well, what time is it? Or did you watch the game this weekend? Or, or whatever. And they deliberately do not listen to that person. And we experience the frustration of trying to tell somebody something that's important, and they're not listening. So we go into prison, and we go through the course. It's a long four-day weekend, very, very powerful and effective. And uh, after we finish, and we go back to the prison one week later, and we start training the men or women who have accepted Christ in discipleship. Now, that's unheard of outside of prison, isn't it? We want Christians to be babies for years. We give the inmates one week, and we start training them as disciples of Christ. And that first week, one thing we do with them is this very listening exercise. But we don't tell them that we're going to be distracted when they try to tell us something. So we go through the cycle of the three, but when the last person is trying to talk to us about something very important, we deliberately frustrate them by saying, uh, what's that camera doing there? And, and what time is lunch? And, and they're saying, hey, we're, we're trying to tell you something. <laughs> We're trying to talk to you. And then after the period of time, we tell them, well, this was just a training exercise in teaching you folks how to listen. If you're going to be effective in a relationship with God and with other people, folks, you need to learn to listen. We all want to talk. We need to learn to listen. So it's very effective. Folks, God wants to speak to us. God wants to talk to us. Listen to this. Psalm 50, verse 7. Psalm 50, verse 7, and Matthew chapter 10, verse 27. Listen to these two passages. Psalm 50, verse 7, God speaking, he says, Hear, O my people, and I will speak. Whoa, he says, Hear, and I will speak. In other words, he's saying, If you'll be quiet long enough for me to talk, I'll talk to you. If you listen, listen to me and I'll talk to you. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 10. He says, What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Two very important thoughts there. First of all, he says, What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is the dark? Does that mean he's going to talk to us at night? Maybe. But do you know what I, how I look at that verse? We have times when we're alone. Uh, we may be a time of, of, of loneliness, of depression, of isolation, of a number of different things. We might call it darkness, a time of darkness. And do you know what, when we're in those positions? Don't think God is not with you. Some of the greatest things God will ever tell you will be in those moments where you're maybe depressed or you're isolated or you're lonely. Look to God and say, Lord, I'm here. I want to fellowship with you in the midst of this time of, of, of a spiritual desert or, or loneliness or even depression. I tell people that I have lived in the dungeons of despair and depression. And in some of those moments are the greatest times that God has spoken to me. He says, what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. But listen to this one. He says, what I whisper in your ear, Proclaim from the roofs. Now is God going to talk? You bet. How is he going to talk? Sometimes it's going to be. And I want to tell you something, folks. If he's going to whisper in your ear, and you're rattling off at the mouth, you're not going to hear what he said. You're not going to hear what God is telling you. You have to be quiet to hear when somebody's whispering in your ear. He will talk. Jesus said, what is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roots. He's going to do it. But you have to learn to listen if you're going to hear the whisper. He will talk. 
The book of Hebrews in the New Testament makes 67 references to God speaking or wanting to speak to his people. Did you know that? 67 references to God speaking or wanting to speak to his people in one book, one New Testament book. Folks, we need to learn to take the time to listen to God speak to us. Now the third thing that Daniel knew is that God may be working out a plan that requires time. And that's why he told the king, give me time and I'll tell you what the dream is and I'll interpret it. Daniel knew that God may be working out a plan. Do you know that God is the, the great architect and builder? Did you know that? Listen to this, Hebrews 11, verses 9 and 10. It says, By faith he, Abraham, made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Whose architect and builder is God. Now, I'm not an architect, folks, but I've been around architects, and you know what they do? They may look at a piece of land and the environment around there, and they start seeing a picture. They might see a building, they might see a community, they might see a whole shopping area, whatever the case. And they start putting a plan together as to what they're going to do to turn that empty piece of land into a whole facility of some type. And you know what? That takes them time to do that. And then they put their plan together, we call it blueprints and so forth, and they get the builders. Now I've worked in construction for years, electrical construction, and I want to tell you something folks, a building doesn't go up overnight. It takes time to build a building, any building. Whether it's the shed in your backyard, or a, a massive hotel, or whatever, an airport, whatever. It takes time. And so, uh, God is the architect and the builder. God may be working out a plan that takes time, and we have to trust Him. We see this in the plan of redemption. As soon as sin entered into mankind, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God says this. He says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. God is speaking to the devil. And you know what he's saying there? He's saying, I'm going to send a Savior. And it's, he's going to be born through a woman. Now, did that Savior come the next day? No. Absolutely not. It took hundreds and several thousand years for God to work out the plan of redemption. But listen to this. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Paul says, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son. When the fullness of time had come, when God's plan, the great architect and builder of redemption, when that time had come and the building was ready, says he sent forth his son. We sent forth his son. Folks, we may have a dream. That dream may have come from God. But God's going to require time in order to bring it to pass. And we have to realize that. We don't always have the lurch relationship with God or that, hey God, mama folio relationship with God. God may have given you a dream, but that dream may take time to come to pass. Joseph had a dream, Genesis 37, 5. It says Joseph had a dream, and he dreamt that God was going to do this spectacular thing through his life. Do you know I'm told it took 17 years for that dream to become reality? 17 years, and in the midst of that, the Bible said that he was shackled, and he was chained, he was put in prisons, he was lied about, but he remained true, knowing that his life was committed to a great architect and builder, and that that took time. Folks, don't throw the towel in and give up. Trust God that he's working out his plan, if we are committed to him. And the last thing that God, that Daniel and his friends knew, and that's why they ask for time, folks, is that time is the test of quality and sincerity. Did you know that? Time is the test of quality and of sincerity. The question is, do we love and believe God enough to prevail in the hardships, the spiritual deserts, and the endless questions and mysteries of life? Do we love Him enough and trust Him to do that? Folks, not everybody does. 
I want to write some verses on the board. Look at these. John chapter 6, verse 66. Matthew 24, verses 45 through 49. And Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. And listen to this quickly. John chapter 6, verse 66. It says, From this time many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. There was a turning back. These were disciples that no longer followed him. Jesus speaking in Matthew 24, he says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of his servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, My master is staying away a long time. Here's the time factor. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. There's a man who could not pass the test of time. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. It's Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Folks, the book of Galatians was written to Christians. There are 23 references in six chapters that Paul is writing to Christians. It is not written to unbelievers. He says, you are deserting the one who called you. Daniel chapter 2 verse 19 tells us that during the night the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Folks, we don't know what night that was. Was it that night that he started praying? Was it two nights later? Or several nights later? We don't know. We do know that there was a test of his faith, a time of waiting in God's presence and of listening to him, and faith that God would do, was doing something that would later be revealed. The questions for us is, are we spending this time that God desires with him? Are we listening to Him? Are we trusting Him to work out a plan or a situation? Will we prevail in our faith and trust? Folks, we can do these things. We can. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. Jesus speaking, He says, His Master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. That's a man or a woman who has been faithful. They have passed the, the test of time and of trust and of faith and so forth. Paul writing in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. We can do that. Just like these, we can do it. I want to close with some promises from God. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. God says, we do not want you to become lazy but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Don't quit. Don't become lazy, he says. Hang in there. Trust God. Spend the time with Him. Listen to what He's trying to tell you. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, Paul writing, he says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Folks, don't give up. At the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't throw the towel in. Amen. Did you say that was Galatians 6, verse 6, chapter, chapter 6, verse 9. Okay. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the example of those who have trusted you and followed you throughout time. Father, those that we see have received the miracles from you and the answers to prayer, the deliverance, the guidance, the provision, whatever it was. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this. And we just ask, Father, that you guide us and help us, Father, as we wait before you to serve you as these great men and women did. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Moses is coming and picking up uh, Vanessa and Jasmine. He is? Yes. Hold on, it just texted me. I'm supposed to have him outside the back of him.